Well, thank you, Callum, and thank you for the invitation to, um, to, to spend time and explain my story. Um, I'm going to take you a, a, a short tour of the, of the farm um, through pictures, but obviously it's not the same as actually being here, and I'd, I'd uh, extend an invitation for anybody to give me a, um, a buzz and uh, come and see, see me um, and, and come and see what I'm doing. So um, I'm going to tell you about, about the farm by starting off by showing you where it is. So Callum's going to move the slides on. So um, I am on the, the, the um, eastern edge of Flanders Moss National Nature Reserve, um, which is just outside Thornhill um, in Stirlingshire. I've been here 31 years and uh, I feel very privileged to be looking after um, a farm which includes part of a national nature reserve. Um, you're looking at 830 odd hectares of a peat bog. So a massively important, um, in fact, the largest peat bog in British Isles. Um, my farm includes, um, the, as I said, the, the, the eastern side, which includes part of the bog, but um, the story of the bog itself is that in the very late 18th century, early 19th century, um, the bog was literally cleared. So if you look at the edge, you'll see that it's surrounded by fields. And those fields are casts of sterling, clay, arable uh, land, mainly growing grass um, with mixed um, with mixed animals, uh, sheep and, and, and cattle. Um, so I have, so the next slide will show you the, um, the, what I've actually got. So I've got in hectares, I've got almost 20 hectares of bog. Um, I've got the edge bit, which is, is my rough grazing. And then I've got a bit of arable and the grassland and some woodland. So that's, that's what I've, that's what I've, when I, when I came here, that's what I had to work with. Uh, in the, uh, the, the, how I've used that, if you like, and how those, those, that land is used is I have rare breed Shetland cattle, um, and they are my conservation grazers on, on Flanders Moss, on the bog, um, on the good arable land, uh, with some difficulty because it's as flat as a pancake and is a basically a floodplain. Um, I grow um, grass, um, hay for hay and haylage. Some is sold and some is for my cattle. I've been experimenting with improving the, the soil by um, planting a or seeding a herbal hay, which has done amazingly well. Um, so that's the 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 uh, the the economic use, if you like, of, of, of the, uh, the farm. And then the diversification, I'll, I will talk a bit more about it all, but I have renovated an old barn and hayloft um, into a, um, a, an art gallery, um, a, a venue, a place where things happen, courses and uh, events, small seminars, etc. Um, that uh, is a, a very versatile space and is used once a year for a big annual, uh, annual exhibition. And then extending this link as, as, as the, the title of the, of the seminar, webinar is, is about, about people, um, I've extended the, uh, the sharing of the place with um, a accommodation in three years. And then finally, the link with people is through local food and looking for ways that we can encourage uh, more local food uh, through local networks for, for, um, uh, for, for distribution and uh, marketing. So that's, 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 the, um, that's, that's what it is, a total of 150 acres um, with a, a diversified set of economic and cultural um, businesses. Just to set you in the sort of the, the historic lands uh, perspective, it's quite interesting and I think to reflect on how people see land um, in terms of its value um, 
uh, over the over the years. So way back, the bog was seen as being providing actually something of use, use i.e. Uh, fuel, peat as fuel. And then as the great agricultural revolution came and the, the, um, the, the land improvement was the, 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 uh, the, the fashion, was it was seen as a, you know, a, an embarrassment on uh, agriculture in, in the UK. So as much as possible was done to tame the wilderness, to turn it into uh, um, productive land. And then as we've, as the uh, decades and the centuries have passed, now we see it actually as a very valuable place um, for, for biodiversity, for, as a boggy ecosystem, for natural flood management, as a carbon sink, and for people to actually um, in, um, enjoy and uh, get uh, re restoratory restorative um, uh, pleasures from. So things change. Um, so when I came 31 years ago, what I found was, and the next slide will give you a picture of the farm. This is, this is standing on the rough ground, looking towards the farmhouse across the arable land um, to, the, to the north with Stuckercroyne and Ben Vorlich, um, the other side, if you like, of the Highland Boundary Fault. So we're sitting way down on the Castle Stirling, some 40 feet above sea level. Um, and the next slide just gives you a feel for the immenseness of that 830 acres of, of uh, National Nature Reserve of the bog. And the cotton grass is, is, a, is um, both, both beautiful and actually lots of nutrition for my cattle. Um, I think the next slide shows the cattle having a having a good graze on that high moss. They are, when I say conservation grazing, um, I have them because they're small, they're light, uh, they're small boned, they're very hardy, and what they're doing is they are munching away um, and being a bit of a vandal um, on the regenerating birch trees. So here is an instant actually where we don't want trees because the trees soup up the water and transpire it and therefore will be encouraging the drying of the bog. And that's the last thing we want. We need, we need the water table as high as possible. Um, so anything that reduces um, the, the rough grasses and the birch, which um, are going to um, you, you know, take up water. So um, that's, that's the moss. And when this, this picture is taken looking south um, towards the Gargunic Hills and the Campses. And so Glasgow is right off to the, the right-hand side at the end of that edge, which is the Drumgoyne um, uh, little hill. So just to um, take, you, take you for a little um, a wander, a little gander um, of some of the, the, the the assets and the importance of the place, all of which I want to share with people and help them to understand what the whole, how the whole farming system works. So there's a picture of, of, of the uh, of some uh, birch woodland and again, my, my little cows. Um, so we all know that planting trees is good for, for carbon capture. Well, it, it is, um, but even, even and more important is peat restoration and peat bogs. And the crux of that is the sphagnum moss, which is on the right-hand side. Um, and that's the, the main peat builder. And it thrives in water, uh, grows and then dies. And as it, as it uh, dies, it can't um, oxidize because there's no, it's under water. And so that's how the peat accumulates bit by bit, one millimeter a year. Doesn't sound a lot, but if you times that by 10,000 years, you've got five plus meters of peat that's built up. So the sphagnum, the, 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 the importance of, uh, of peat, as we all know, is, is really, really, really important. So peat restoration and improvement of the peat bog is one of my main farm uh, criteria. 
And then if we look to see the, uh, the other challenge that we have, um, the whole, as I was saying, what we want to do is keep the, the, the water level as high as possible. Um, and some very interesting work is being, I have done at West Moss side to um, actually hold as much water as possible on the bog. And the top left picture shows a, a dam. And you can see that at the top of the picture, the water is at the top of the dam and at the bottom, it's, it's uh, you know, a meter plus lower. So we're holding the water on the bog. And that's the name of the game. Um, it's quite interesting because uh, farmers and my neighbors can't quite get their handle on the idea of not dredging and draining. The name of the game is to do the absolute opposite, is to dam up all the ditches around the bog, hold the water on the bog, it's a humongous sponge, and when we have these flash floods, which we have more and more, then what you want to do is slow the flow. Um, and that is natural flood management in action. And you can see that that's, what, that's exactly what's happening here. Um, but obviously you also have to have some kind of management that's going on. And again, in comes my, my cattle that are keeping, keeping the, um, the vegetation down. But the bottom right hand picture is not uncommon. That is my hay fields in uh, midwinter. So um, it's a it's a it's a floodplain, and we have to live with the fact that we're holding water up the catchment um, and as much as possible on the bog. Um, so uh, let's move to um, a more <laughs> a more productive page. Um, of the of of the of the um, West Moss side, so with the the uh, arable land is uh, very very clay, very very wet, difficult to to manage. But if you get a good year, um, then the hay is is fantastic. Um, the um, I, uh, the the picture the big picture is this year's herbal lay, um, which has been very successful. And that what's so important about that is that um, the mix and the biodiversity of the, uh, of the grass species and the herbs means that the soil is full of mycorrhizal um, uh, activity um, and uh, soil, soil bacteria and soil mi microbiology is, is, is very live. So that the all the, the richness, the minerals in the soil are being um, activated and released um, and providing an absolute natural source uh, of fertilizer. And it's very interesting, interesting research at the moment that has discovered that ryegrass, which is the universal sugar producing grass, very effective, very efficient that has no relationship with any mycorrhizal. So the only way you can fertilize, a, fertilize in inverted commas, a ryegrass field is with inorganic fertilizer. Whereas herbs and many other of the grasses do it themselves through their relationship with, with mycorrhiza. So this is a bit of an experiment, but there's no doubt that it's, I'm looking after the soil here, and the result is a lot of, of hay. <laughs> um, the other thing about hay and conservation um, and biodiversity is that by making hay, and indeed by therefore not cutting until first, second week of July, it gives the ground uh, nesting birds, like the curlew, a chance to nest and, uh, and fledge their, their chicks. So uh, I'm a bit of a, um, uh, a champion for the curlew. And the picture on the bottom right is one of the outputs of a project done with um, uh, school kids from, uh, Sterling, uh, from Wallace High School in Stirling, where we had them out, the art students and the music students on a project called Dawn Chorus. And the focus was on the curlew. Um, 
and we produced two uh, willow sculptures of, of, of the curlew, and that's, that's one of them. So in everything that I do here, and that this is one of the things that I think has got so much potential, is that you know, the, the farming practices are fascinating stories to be told to, to the general public, whether, whether it's children or young people or students or indeed visitors. So the story of the curlew raises all the issues of, of, of modern day farming and the options that we have in balancing biodiversity and, and, and production. Um, and the next slide just reminds us that um, you know things are pretty tough in farming, um, and there is so much potential um, in in the crisis that we're in to actually look at what the alternatives are. Um, and I'm a big fan of what you might want to call regenerative farming practices. Um, it's a bit of a jargon word, but I think we know what that means. Um, so the sort of things, the practices that I'm, I'm um, following here at West Moss Side will, I hope, be fighting climate change, certainly protecting biodiversity and nature, and building uh, you know, our health with food that is, is produced uh, organically um, and locally, and therefore building some uh, better food security that we, you know, we, we, we are now faced with. And I can't ever have a picture without my pup, my collie pup, um, Faith. <laughs> um, so that's, that's uh, well, this is another, another couple of slides about the farm and what I'm doing. Um, here is uh, one of the things about farming very wet land is a field rush. Um, it's a nightmare. I've been on various courses, I think some run by yourselves about how to manage rush pasture. And basically there isn't really an answer other than draining it, um, which is not an option. So I cut it and cut it and cut it. And again, the, the cattle move in afterwards. Um, but those rush fields also hold um, some important, um, well, lots of orchids and, uh, um, and the heath um, butterfly. But equally, bizarrely, I mean, I've got obviously acres of the stuff, but I use the rush in crafts. So again, you can have people feeling and touching and working with a natural material in weaving that is actually part of the West Moss Side farm story. So that the um, each each February there's a I think it's the second of February is St Brigitte Day, and the tradition, um, particularly in Ireland, was to make a St Brigitte cross, uh, which you put on your uh, uh, on your on the door of your farm shed, which would bring you fertility and happiness and everything that goes with. <laughs> being an Irish farmer. Um, but it, this, what the point is that, you know, you don't have to look far to see where the stories link with what people might be interested to hear about. Um, and finally, on the, on the, on the tour of the, of the farm, then there is all, all the op options of, of working with, with education, interpretation, and just providing a space um, for, well, you might call it a therapeutic landscape, uh, which is apparently a new new term. So I think I have a therapeutic landscape where people can just just um, chill. <laughs> but equally, I do a lot of work um, in you know in, in biological and bio, biodiversity monitoring. Um, had the the congress of, of international soil scientists here a couple of weeks ago, looking at the soils, getting very excited. Um, about the clay soil. So it's an area that it, it's, a, it's a farm that is very open to, you know, to be looked at, to be picked apart and to be, to be, um, uh, to be understood more. So that's the sort of well-being and the, the monitoring side. And then that all comes together um, with the growing um, uh, area of uh, agritourism. Um, and I've been involved with that notion for right since it sort of popped its head up. 
um, I think it was about 2016 or 17 or maybe a bit before, um, with the whole notion that what we need to do is find a long term, term sustainable future for farming, um, which through, if you like, uh, providing real visitor experience of working farms where food and drink is at its core. That's the sort of purpose. And over the last, last four or five years, um, this has now been now been seen by the Scottish Government as a genuine sector which um, is worth money, you know, real money, money in pounds. Um, and, and I think we now have about, we now know that there are about 500 businesses um, where, their where their principal focus is agritourism, and that's worth, you know, the odd one billion pounds, whatever that means. Um, but it is a, what, what has happened as, the, as, as a result of thinking about this and, and uh, businesses coming together to share ideas and support each other um, is that there is, we've, uh, there is now an actual strategy for what it's worth, um, signed off by Mari Goodgen um, uh, for agritourism in Scotland. Um, it provides a firm basis for, for um, just for branding so that when people come to a farm, they might see the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the cow with the, with the colored wellies, which is quite fun. Um, and they know what they're going to expect. They're going to expect, you know, high, high quality, authentic um, uh, experience of staying or, or eating or um, enjoying being on a farm, a farm tour. So it's, a, it's, you know, watch this space, it's taking off. And I think it's going to be something that's important for the, for the future of farming um, and linking with people so that farms aren't, you know, fenced off areas that are, are no-go areas. So it's inviting people, but having something to offer. So um, what I have to offer on the sort of straightforward tourism, yeah, the next slide shows um, I have uh, yurts, three Kyrgyz yurts, um, which actually I put um, into the, in, onto the farm um, 12 years ago, you know, <laughs> which was kind of cutting edge, you know, yurts in Scotland, you must be joking. Well, um, I'm still going and it's and people absolutely and totally love it. It's a total restorative immersion is one of the one of the words that somebody used or a, a spirit lifting experience. Um, people are looking for traveling, you know, with purpose. They're interested in farming. They're interested in rewilding. Um, you know, there are, you know, there's a genuine interest in understanding what living on a farm and, and, and working a farm is all about. So um, I have three um, yurts. They, they are now set in woodland, the woodland which I planted um, 25, 30 years ago. This, uh, this, this area, you can see, see what was actually just a, a field, an agricultural field with no interest at all. It's now um, three yurts with a woodland and and a fantastic um, meadow. I don't know where all the plants have come from because it was just an ordinary meadow and I've got, now I've got um, wonderful biodiversity. So that lets people, as, you, as I say, live the experience um, and have cows in the field right next to them and the curlew calling and uh, otters in the river and you know things that people just have never ever had the opportunity before. And I think it's an, a, a, you know, the route that, that we should be taking. Um, I, I commented on the fact that you know, I use my, my creative arts um, in many ways. And the next slide just shows some of the things that emerge when you let loose artists um, in, in, at, at Westmoss side. My partner is a, a landscape artist and his inspiration for his paintings largely come from, you know, 10 meters away. Um, I use all the things that I grow or find on the bog or on the farm for my weaving. I'm a basket weaver, but a sort of um, 
more than that, I use uh, well, that, you could, the, the basket I'm just finishing off has got cotton grass, it's got birch in it, and it's got willow, all of which grown on the farm. And the bottom three uh, on the left hand side is uh, purple moor grass, which is, and I only, I only discovered it from a beekeeper, purple moor grass, which grows extensively on the bog, is the best stuff for making bee skips. So that's a bee skip being made out of purple moor grass. The middle one is, believe it or not, that is a moss called Polytricum, star moss, which in, 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 uh, in 100 years ago plus, was used to make rope. Um, and I use it to make all sorts of things, including this coiled basket. And the one on the right is um, part of the willow fedge that uh, surrounds the, the yurts. Um, and that is some kind of dinosaur, I think somebody said it was. Um, each year, people come and help, and uh, we make slightly crazy things out of the, um, the, the, the willow hedge. So there's so much you can do. And this has attracted other uh, friends, tutors, artists, and creative people. And each year, we come together uh, for something called Fourth Valley Art Beat, which is a mega event all over the Fourth Valley and West Moss Side, which is the, um, the, the steading and the hayloft, uh, become an art gallery. And just three of the artists that are, that, uh, are regular, um, regular um, um, exhibitors at Art Beat. And we have something like four or 500 people over the week um, who come. They not only enjoy the art, but they take a walk around the, the farm at the same time. And they perhaps go away with a steak or two or a pound of mince. Um, so it's another way of getting the different community of people to the farm um, to explain and to enjoy and just be here. Um, so that's the art and creative side. And that is a very uh, flexible space. Um, I say it was the hayloft. Um, it runs workshops and, and seminars. The other thing I did was, was set up a commercial kitchen. And although it's not been used as much as I would like, I did have a, a 18 months with a wonderful chef called Andrew Barrowcliffe, who uh, we set up a little project called Fertile Ground. Um, but then came pandemic and he moved on and there is a... There is an opportunity. That's the other thing about when you when you have flexibility, then there's chances for somebody to, to knock on the door and say, I've got an idea. Um, you know, would it fit in with what you're doing? And this I'm just sit waiting for some food project to come and and, and join me um, on the fertile ground. <laughs> so finally, um, I'm just looking at the food side. Um, uh, we have, I have very few, but significant in terms of the business, uh, cows or rather bullocks that need to end up in the market. Now, being an incredibly small uh, business, how do I supply, how do I get my beef to the market in a way that has the maximum impact for, for, for customers and people. So the local food, local food is, is again, uh, particularly over, over COVID obviously, is massively important. Um, and in terms of the economy, um, we know that if you spend 10 pounds in a local food outlet, it's going to be, that money is gonna stay in the, in the local economy and will be, will be worth 25 pounds. If you spend 10 pounds in a supermarket, then very little of that is gonna stay in the local economy. And those figures, I don't know quite where they've come from, but you know, that, is, that is fact. Um, so locally produced food, um, which has been bought locally, is um, you know, much, much more valuable to the local economy than some long distance producer bringing it in to a supermarket and being bought that way. So we know that we want to support the local food economy. However, we don't have 
that many effective and efficient systems for doing it. One of the organizations that I'm very closely linked with is Fourth Environment Link, and they've been working with local food uh, routes for a long time. And quite recently, we've just finished a project looking um, at regional food hubs. Um, and the, the example, the pilot has been the, this, this, this organization called Neighbor Food, which is, should be, and it's planned to be, good for local small producers and good for local um, uh, customers. How it works is it's online um, and there are different hubs and hosts uh, scattered across Scotland. Local to me, there's one in Balfron that um, links to Killern, Aberfoyle and Drimmon. There's one in Killin. Uh, there's one in uh, Pitlochry and uh, that's, those are the ones that I provide. So what happens is those markets are live online once a week with everything you might need for your weekly shop. Um, you, you buy it online, you pay for it online, and then you go and collect your food from one of the hubs. Um, and the whole point of it is to close down the link between the local producer and the customer. In its best way, the hub is also a kind of educational um, hub so that the stories about the farm, the producers, um, sometimes the producers will actually go to the hub and give a you know, demonstration about what they're producing, whether it's the cheeses or pickles or, uh, or whatever. So it's all about presenting greater opportunities for, for, for purchasing local food. There are, there are obviously other models um, but this is a way that um, does enable local producers to get small amounts to market. And it has been vital for me um, because it's a bit feast and famine. You know, I've, I've got a beast and I, 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 uh, uh, you know, I, I sell it and then it's not in a couple of weeks and there's nothing. So it's, it goes with the seasons and it goes with the, um, uh, the availability. So it's, it's been a, so neighbor food is one way of supporting the local food economy. And I think uh, I've just got one more, two more slides. Uh, the next one is linked again to this, this project, the Regional Food Hubs project. Just to, you know, the, 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 the data is that 137 small businesses, one of which will be me, have joined in on the markets and it has provided additional sales channel. And the customers are more than three and a half thousand people, mainly in rural areas um, to make that connection. And it's also become a bit like the, uh, the agritourism group. It's a community. So sharing, sharing problems, sharing ideas um, and making those connections between people. So it has been successful, but there's still challenges. And I'd just like to leave you with this final slide which is kind of my, my wish list for what I would like to see, how I'd like to see um, the rural landscape and the farming landscape um, uh, evolve. Um, and uh, we're getting there in some ways. The, the uh, major issues, I mean, seriously major issues and great frustration with, with Scottish government on infrastructure. We've just had a local uh, Cooper, very valuable butcher closing just last week, Downfield Farm, which is used by many small um, producers, including organic producers. So there is now no butcher which is organically uh, um, in my, anywhere near me. Um, that is, has organic status. The reason why the, to get the organic status is a nightmare of forms and bureaucracy and lack of trust about professional butchers and their practice. Um, and obviously local abattoirs has been an issue that has been on the cards for decades, no further forward. Um, 
So, you know, the, the reality, or even the, all the good things that the government is talking about, increasing organics, more local food, the, the infrastructure just is not there, and it needs some serious um, uh, lobbying of, of Scottish government. So that's, that's where I am. These are the, uh, the organizations that I work with, um, all of which are kind of communities of interest and supply, su supply and su a, a lot of support. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, well, obviously interested to uh, answer any questions that may be coming up on the question and answer page. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, that's a brilliant uh, presentation. It's always really, really interesting to hear what's what's happening at West Mossside uh, Farm. In the interest of time, I'm just going to jump straight on um, and I'm going to bring up Kerry's slides. If you just hold on a second. OK, well, thank you very much. And Kate, that was an amazing presentation. And uh, oh, I'm in total awe of what you achieved on your farm. And actually, you know, some of the things I'm going to talk about link completely to to what you're you, you're talking about there. And I think that, you know, in everything you do, you're, you're thinking about how you engage with customers and consumers. And that's that's a big thing for farmers to do, you know. So uh, and that's uh, what I want to build on today. And I'm going to touch on kind of four key things, really. I'm going to touch on the regional food groups and food tourism. Uh, which links again back to some of the things Kate said. I'm going to talk a little bit about awards and just tell you about two awards that I've been involved in this year. And then I want to touch a little bit on Foraging Fortnight. And, and Kate alluded to there some of the grow, growing interest by consumers of, of, um, of where our food comes from. And, and there, are, there are lots of, there are sort of five key themes in the, in the food sector. Um, and, and they've been really impacted on by the, the, the pandemic. Local food is, has been huge. Local food producers were the heroes in the pandemic, and, and that will be forgotten by some, but not by everybody. And, and people are more interested now in the natural world around them. They're, they're interested in sustainability and, and our planet. And, and, and interestingly as well, and you did touch upon this as well, that sort of wild food, sustainable, well-being, self-care space that our natural environment can can, uh, can offer us and provide for us. So uh, I, I just wanted to add that because I thought that was really poignant and I think it's, it's, it's front and centre of most of the things I do actually. So in terms of um, my next slide, if we could go to my next slide, I want to just touch on the, the work of regional food groups. Uh, now there are 18 regional food groups across Scotland um, from Ayrshire and East Lothian to Orkney and Shetland and and these food groups, they're, they're, you, you can find the list on the Scotland Food and Drink website. Um, Scotland Food and Drink and Fiona Richmond has done a lot of work with them. We and my team work with them as well. Um, but they bring together producers like Kate um, and, and, and other secondary producers as well. They bring together hospitality and tourism businesses, independent retailers, markets, farmers markets, craft markets, all these things, and, and the people and the organisations interested in growing and, and innovating in that local food economy. So there's lots of information around the different food groups. So the reason I'm bringing this up is if you are interested in, in local food or food from your farm and selling it direct to the consumer, then you need to be a member of your local food group. That's really, really important because you'll, it's a source of valuable information and it's a community in your geographical area. And you can find out more, as I've said, on the Scotland Food and Drink website. Um, so do be, become a part of your regional food group if you um, are doing anything in terms of local food and drink. And the other thing I wanted to touch on is the fact that in the last couple of years, um, 25 regional food tourism ambassadors have been appointed across Scotland and, and this is in line with the food tourism strategy which again I've put a link in the presentation but can be found on the Scotland Food and Drink website and this is all about raising awareness, raising the profile in Scotland and um, creating and, and, and helping to really profile Scotland as a global food tourism destination. You know, we've seen how well other countries do it. Um, and there's some really good examples in Scotland, but there's also lots of stuff that can be done. So um, this is all part of the Food Tourism Scotland strategy. And there's an action plan in there. And that's delivered in partnership with the Scottish uh, Tourism Alliance. So, again, something to look out for if you're interested in creating 
a, a, a tourism outlet on farm that has a link back to food. And uh, the last thing I really wanted to say was if you have a, an idea for a collaboration initiative that promotes and celebrates local food and drink, regional food and drink, then there is the Regional Food Fund. Now, um, applications for 2022 are closed for now, but do look out on the Scotland Food and Drink website for opportunities for 2023. Um, my, myself and my team as part of when we managed Connect Local for the Scottish Government, we ran the first four iterations of the Regional Food Fund and we gave out in total 79 grants across Scotland to local food and drink initiatives and the impact for, I'm going to get this figure wrong, I think it was for every pound spent in grant, given in grant, 18 pounds, 18 more pounds were created in the local economy. I think that's the figure, there's two figures, um, but certainly if, if it's not that one, it's a very much higher figure. So again, alluding back to what Kate was saying, the economic impact of working with local and buying local is huge, absolutely huge. If I could have the next slide, please tell us. So I just wanted to touch on awards because I think awards are a really good mechanism for businesses like Kate's um, and other businesses in the local food and drink and the food tourism arena, and not just food tourism, agritourism, rural tourism, farm tourism, uh, to get yourself noticed, to, to, to raise your awareness and profile. Um, so this year, um, I was lucky enough to be invited to be a judge for the Rare Beef Survival Trust inaugural Food and Farming Sustainability Awards. And the whole ethos of these awards was around sustainability in food and sustainability in farming. And it was an absolute pleasure to judge this. Um, we sponsored the, the Sustainable Produce Retail Outlet of the Year as a business, but I learned so much. And, and really it was rewarding to see the amount and the range and the variation and the diversification going on across Scottish landowners. So farms, crofters, and also smallholders. And, and this really is highlighting the need for a sustainable approach, the need for you know, the, the increased consumer interest in local food and drink and short supply chain in the natural environment. And it's maximizing benefits for, for smaller Scottish producers. Um, there are 10 categories. I'm sure that will be reviewed again for next year. I've spoken to um, Martin um, Beard who organized it, and this will run again in 2023. So something to look out for. Uh, 2023 awards will be launched around February, March next year. Uh, so that's the, the Rare Beef Survival Trust. And you can see there that um, that, that was the, the judges and um, the awards are made at the Highland Show this year. So if I could have the next slide, please, Callum. The next one is again, another award, but it's all around diversification this. And um, last year we facilitated this award as part of AgriScot. It was the first year the Diversified Farm of the Year Award ran. We facilitated it um, and uh, the, Royal, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland promoted it, uh, sorry, um, sponsored it. This year we're both sponsoring and facilitating it. And we're doing that because diversification on farm is central to what, um, especially what my team does, but what all our colleagues do um, across our um, the, the SAC consulting as well. So really interesting here to celebrate farm businesses that have invested time and resource to develop an additional income stream alongside their farming, day-to-day -day farming practices. Sometimes the income stream is all around those farming practices, but another times it's about something completely different. And again, um, judges um, were really keen and, and, and the rewards there and seeing a wide range of applicants come forward. The winner last year was uh, Louise and Graham Nicholl from Newton Farm Holidays and Tours. And that was all around, you know, um, alternative livestock, um, farm holidays, farm tours. They're based in Angus and it's around holiday accommodation, farm experience, alpaca walking, those sorts of things. So again, something a little bit different, a bit like you talked about there, Kate, with your yurts. Um, entering an award gives you massive coverage as a business. You have the opportunity to raise your profile, to tell your story, to get some coverage in terms of um, profiling, promotion, social media. You also get to, to, to learn from other people and see what other people are doing. And it's massive. It's fantastic. The launch 
of this award last year reached 187,000 people. So, you know, being part of something like this is really good for business. And again, it's a good way of engaging with the consumer. And for my last slide, I'm just going to touch on something I'm heavily involved in. And I partner Nature Scott to deliver this. And um, I thoroughly believe in, in the link to wild food and sustainable foraging and the opportunities this can create for businesses um, based on the fact that consumers that the, are based on the increasing consumer interest. And so I've curated five events for businesses for Foraging Fortnight this year. Um, I've highlighted the five events there. Uh, so there's one around emerging foraged um, flavors and that's, that's all around storytelling. So I have um, a, a botanist, Greg Kenneser from the Royal Botanic Gardens talking around the plant law, uh, you know, stories around plants. And I have two businesses telling the story. So if you're a business that's interested in making a link to wild food and when sustainably foraged food, or it's already part of your business, that's a really good event to come to think about. How do I, how do I strengthen the story around that? There's then two events, um, and all this information can be found on the Foraging Fortnight website. There's then two events around helping people develop products or helping advise people. And we have, um, we host a panel, um, a panel um, from my team, uh, and it's all around, do you have a product, product problem? Do you have a, that could be marketing, it could be um, an actual ingredient issue, it might be an opportunity, something you want to put a, put a question to the panel and we, we answer it. And it's it's one-to-one, -one, short, sharp, 20-minute sessions, and they go down extremely well. The um, last two events, uh, one is around back garden foraging. Now, this is actually building on that interest in small spaces, that interest in the environment around us. People being in the pandemic took a small piece of the, you know, whether it was a small back garden, whether it was a balcony in a block of flats, or whether it was a bigger garden, you know, there's that interest in creating that those sort of back garden edibles, sort of foraging closer to home. And this is really aimed at, you know, people that might want to be selling um, plants. It might be garden centers, it might be plant nurseries, it might be somebody who's got a little bit of land and wants to do something different with it. Uh, and that event again uh, will explore that. And I'm hoping to capture a little bit of a broader market there um, for that event. The final event is um, with the chef uh, in our team. We have a development chef, Morag, on our team. And that's all about picking, preserving, and uh, presenting. Uh, so Morag runs her own business uh, in uh, St. Andrews. She has a, a restaurant um, and does a lot based on wild foods. But um, interestingly, um, we're going to do this and get people to think a little bit more about, OK, foraging comes in seasons. What can I do? How can I present it? How can I put things away and preserve them for later on in the year? And how can I create that lovely plate of food? So you, you, that could be catering outlets. It could be cafes. It could be restaurants. It could be pubs. It could be hotels. So that's a wee flavour there, uh, no pun intended, of the events that are purely aimed at businesses. So they're all free. Um, uh, they are funded through uh, the University Innovation Fund uh, in terms of because it's funding knowledge transfer. And it's really about helping businesses capture that opportunity that wild and sustainably foraged foods bring. So please do go onto the Foraging Fortnight website, have a look. If something takes your fancy, sign up for it. It's, they're all online, they're all free. And uh, I, I'm, we've already got quite a few people signed up, but obviously it's online. So the more the merrier. Uh, so uh, that's all I want to say today. Um, I hope that that's been of use and of interest. And I think it chimes very nicely, actually, with a lot of what you heard from Kate. So thank you very much for listening tonight. Well, thank you, Kerry. It does it does uh, follow on very well from what Kate was saying. Uh, and there's lots of you know, there's lots happening uh, over the next few months. And and as Kerry says, you know, you can find out more uh, by heading to the foraging fortnight uh, website um, and also um, you can get in touch with the team uh, either through the, the farm advisory service uh, helpline or, or through our own SEC consulting website.